They were Prime Time's naughtiest neighbors. I would take my clothes off and it just got me like brushing my teeth. Heather couldn't help being Dixonish and bitchy. Oh yeah. Who sparked a Monday night obsession. The response from the audience was incredible. People came out of the woodwork. A lot of letters from prison, I remember. They love their Melrose Place over there in jail. From tales of salacious sex. Well, I slept with Jake and his brother. God knows there were some guest stars in there. There was something in the elevator, too, if I recall. <laughs> <laughs> to the theater of the absurd. <clears throat> I'm sure, you know, when I'm 80, they'll be going, nah, nah, nah. So I take the door and I slam it against my head. It was just an image where I went, what have we done? These are the stories of TV's ultimate playpen, told by the people who slept there. They wanted craziness, they wanted sex, they wanted insane asylums, because that's ultimately where we all belong anyway. When Melrose Place ruled the world. In a world where only mini skirts sold and monogamy was a crime. Our Mondays were taken over and turned into uh, Melrose Nights. And so began a time of pure bitchcraft. Where only psychos reign. And Locklear was the name of the game. When Melrose Place ruled the world. I saw Melrose Place as a mini little community where beautiful people lived. You wanted to watch these people and you wanted to see how they were gonna up their lives. <laughs> I wanted to do a show about young adults in their 20s, kind of that period right out of college when you're sort of figuring out your life, living in this really kind of hip part of LA. Melrose Avenue was an intriguing place for people um, throughout America. The storefronts were very colorful and different. I mean, everything was happening on the street. You'd go and sit in a cafe and have your latte and think about what you wanted to do with your life. You know, that was it. Noah's place was coming off the flame of 90210. In the way that 90210 started with a group of unknowns, I think we were sort of looking to do the same thing with Noah's place. I was called to come in to meet Darren Starr, and he started describing this ensemble of young people he was looking for. The most fun I had on that show was casting. There were a lot of actors we were considering for these roles, like Matthew Perry, George Clooney, I read Callista Flockhart, Jennifer Aniston. I do remember meeting Courtney Cox and knowing Courtney Cox because she'd been on Family Ties. It came down to, right at the end, Courtney Cox and Courtney Thorne Smith. At the end of the day, Courtney Thorne Smith was the most right and gave a lot of heart to Allison. I was doing a sitcom called The Hogan Family, and I had a film offer at the same time I was going in for Melrose Place. I didn't have to interview for it. I got lucky. I had just relocated from New York. I got a call from my agent that I got the job, and so I'm just screaming, I got Melrose, I got it. With that initial cast, pretty much all the right people got the job. I mean, it was all so new and exciting, and we were all such unknowns for the most part. I'm telling you, folks were delivering pizza before they got this gig. The promotion for the show was huge. It was almost like the show was the it show before it happened. There was a lot of press for Melrose Place before it came out. No one had to wait anymore when it finally aired July 8th, 1992. There was a lot of pressure on Melrose Place to be a hit right off the bat, and it wasn't. I mean, I really kind of cringe when I watched the pilot. The whole show was launched with the dilemma of Allison losing a roommate and having to replace her. This is gonna be the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I'm an adult, and I'm gonna have to deal with it. I'll have to find a roommate, I don't know. I'm sorry. And then picking a guy, Billy, which was, you know, kind of a big deal then to have a guy roommate. Always, always leave the toilets down. The storylines at the beginning of the season were very mundane. Basically, it was just trying to establish eight characters that you hope people are going to invest in. Matt was the gay character. That's primarily who he was. He's cute. Oh, don't even try it. I saw him first. My character's name was Jane Mancini, and I was married to Michael Mancini, who was a doctor. 
He was working really long hours, and of course, I was probably suffering from that. If we don't spend some quality time together soon, we're going to be headed for trouble. I'm Jake Hansen. Jake was the resident hunk. Why is it that every time a girl doesn't show up at night, people think she's in my apartment? Amy Locaine played Sandy, a struggling actress, blonde, beautiful. I got a call from Forever and Tomorrow. They're creating a new character and they want me to read for it. They decided to make her roommate with an African-American girl. Rhonda was a fitness instructor. Here we go! My initial reaction was, oh, good God, it's the token black character. And they wrote her like it. Mm -hmm. The whole girl snuck out of here like a cat burglar around five this morning. I think part of that could have been certainly remedied if they had more people who look like Rhonda also writing for Rhonda. We spent so many episodes developing these earnest characters that you felt were real, not necessarily like the most exciting people in the world. I mean, come on, Michael, a decorating committee? I mean, seriously, what do I know about decorating for a party? When I watched it, I went, this is boring. If this was going to be a representation of my generation and of me, I wanted to think that we were going to be more interesting than that. The ratings took a, took a dip. There was fear of the show being canceled. So before people tuned out, I think they were smart enough to make some changes. Okay. Midway through season one, Amy Locaine was let go. Okay, I'll call you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Sandy was not a role the writers and the creators ever felt they got a true handle on. Vanessa Williams wasn't asked back to the show. It was devastating because I knew it wasn't my work. I think they were scared to see Rhonda start jumping in bed with uh, Jake. One, two, three, four! We went, okay, they aren't buying sensitive, they're not buying introspection, they want something else, and we either just keep doing it this way and go off the air, or we change things. They wanted to bring some other elements, some sort of edge into this more realistic concept. Then we were just sort of thinking about who else could we bring in that would, you know, add some intrigue to the storylines. Daphne Zunica was brought in the first season. Daphne and I were roommates together at UCLA. Darren called and said, look, I'm doing this show, and I'm going to do this really cool character. Joe Reynolds was a photographer. The idea was to bring on this tough chick. I don't follow anyone else's rules. I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable. Who left her husband, had some shady past, wore black, and wasn't going to like hang out by the pool. How cozy. I think it was almost like adding another male character, because she was such a tomboy. The first time I saw Joe, I thought, where was Nancy McKean when we needed her? Marsha Cross came in as a guest star. I played Kimberly Shaw, and I was actually hired to play opposite Michael Mancini. She ended up having an affair with Michael and ruining my entire marriage. Do you see this, Kimberly? This signifies something. A commitment, a trust, a bond between two people. Look, there's really no point in explaining now. If you'll excuse me, I have to get back to work. It all went downhill from there, pretty much, with, with Michael. Laura Layton came on to play my little sister, Sydney. Hey, how you doing? Sydney was like that annoying little sister that comes to town and says she's coming for a week and stays for four years. Sydney, I'm sorry. I can't entertain you tonight, OK? <laughs> I'm not asking you to. All right, fine, then go find something to do and leave me alone. I can't be your babysitter. Babysitter? And she's really cute and she's really annoying and she'll do anything to get ahead. We were getting a little sexier, so that was the first little steps to let's wow them a little bit. The show still needed a shot in the arm. I think they were trying to find the chemistry of the show and needed another character to bring some more spark. If you're going to do a serialized show or a soap opera, you've got to have that bitch. The show was in trouble. We needed to do something. I felt that if we were going to do a soap, you know, let's just pull out all the stops. Coming up, a veteran vixen turns up the heat. Heather can help being vixenish and bitchy. Shut up. Just shut up and listen to me. And later, a harebrained plot. Whenever I see Marsha, it's hard not to picture the scar, like right there. Next, on When Melrose Place Ruled the World. When Melrose Place Ruled the World.
when you see the statistics for Melrose Place, the first year the show did not do well. They started to see the ratings slowly drop. The show was kind of basically so, so, or in the Come here, I want to show you something. Characters were building relationships with each other, but there, w there weren't sort of big melodramatic storylines. The top two shelves are mine, the bottom two shelves are yours. That way there's never any confusion. <laughs> you put your name on everything? Just my stuff. They needed to find a way to infuse the show with something exciting. The one thing that Melrose was missing was a villain. They needed an A actress to be in the A story and put Melrose Place on the map. So Aaron Spelling decided he needed to bring in his good luck charm, Heather Locklear, to salvage the show. Heather Locklear's first thing she did for me was a cop show with William Shatner. And from there we put her on Dynasty. When her name first came up in the writing staff, we all went, Heather Locklear, she must be 110. So it was kind of like, we want to bring in somebody that felt like they were from like another era of TV into somebody that's supposed to be kind of like hip and cool and everything like that. Darren quietly asked Darren for a piece of recent tape on Heather, and we just looked at it within two minutes. I went, oh my God, she's beautiful. And we realized she's young enough and she's got that sparkle. She was the celebrity icon, you know, reason to watch. She was the bitch, so it was perfect, right? Heather Locklear came on as Amanda Woodward, and she worked at d d Advertising. She came in as a character that was Allison's boss. Hello. Hi, how are you? Allison, of course, now has something new to bitch about. Here comes a hotter blonde with a little more spunk, a little more attitude. Shut up. Just shut up and listen to me. Her bitchcraft was desperately needed on the show. I'm the baddest chick. She plays this character who is really bad to the bone. I mean, she's pretty nasty. I don't know what you use to pull this off, you dishonest, self-serving, pathetic drunk. But when I find out, I'm going to turn it around, cut you open like a rotten piece of fruit. Not a lot of people can play a bitch and be likable. She was just uh, fearless. She was in control of everything, of her men, of her career. People loved her because they wanted to be her. You know, walk in the office wearing whatever she wants, bossing people around. My office, now. And having absolutely no qualms about it. That's why I'm the best chick. Who's bad? She was my heroine on Melrose Place. You were incredible last night. Better than ever. Who is it? It's me, Allison. The initial love triangle between Allison, Billy, and Amanda Hi. was the catalyst for the rest of the, the, the show's success. Great dress, Allison. Thank you. Yeah, yours too. You like it? Where's your date, Amanda? Oh, it was so last minute I couldn't find anyone. Pitiful, huh? Amanda, you want to dance? Later. And that opened up a whole uh, Pandora's box of things that could happen. So when the claws started coming out, it was just time to have fun and take the gloves off. When they all started cohabitating together and sleeping with each other, it just became like this big group where all this incest was going on. A nice way to wake up. And that's when it really took off. When Heather came on the show, <laughs> That's sort of when all the sex started. That just became a part of Melrose Place. She was actually with every single one of the men on that show. I think Heather led the charge. Heather couldn't help being vixenish and bitchy. Taylor, my character, was such a slut. I would take my clothes off and be on a table and making out with Tom's claw bro in one moment and then run over and be in bed with Jack Wagner. <laughs> And it just got to be like brushing my teeth. It's just like so uncomfortable, no matter how many times you do it. And you know, you're making out with your friends, basically. <laughs> well, I slept with Jake and his brother. God knows there were some guest stars in there. There was something in the elevator too, if I recall. I did run into a couple guys after the show and they were like, hi, and I was like, hi. I played your boyfriend on the show, you know, we had a date, we were kissing, and I was like, sorry, you gotta be a little more clear. <laughs>
There was this buzz that started happening. The ratings start to pick up. When we're out shooting, somebody tells us that our show has been picked up for another year and we all dove into the pool. It was all new and exciting. The stage was set for this uh, phenomenon. By season two, which was 1993, Melrose Place was a, a bona fide hit. Our numbers were over 14 million viewers and climbing. Melrose Place became a national obsession, and then things just got nuts. Everyone wanted a piece of Melrose Place. It was hot, it was popular, and it sold. You would see the whole cast on the cover of TV Guide. You'd see them on the cover of Soap Opera Magazine. The Entertainment Weekly and the Rolling Stone covers really put us in the mainstream. I just remember not believing that I was shooting the cover of Rolling Stone. I remember once I was an answer in a crossword puzzle. There was no shortage of coverage on them, and we loved it. Melrose Place spawned fashion trends. You know, it was about being sexy and hip. I think people were just trying to look like those characters every day. You saw people wanting Josie Bissett's little pixie cut. Why wouldn't you want to look like Josie Bissett? The craze with that haircut was that I think a lot of women want to cut their hair short, and but they just don't have the nerve to do it. Amanda's micro mini skirts became acceptable office wear. Certainly I wore my share. I would look at the wardrobe and I would say, okay, it has to be shorter. By the time the show ended, my dresses were obscene. They were up so high. This is Melrose Place. That was the fun of it. People came out of the woodwork. Certainly there were a lot of Melrose Place fans. Fan mail was huge. Thousands and thousands of letters to every single one of those actors. A lot of letters from prison, I remember. <laughs> a lot of prisoners right away. They love their Melrose Place over there in jail. When the OJ trial was going on, the sequestered jurors wanted episodes of Melrose Place. You know, I think it's very difficult to tell them they can't watch television at all. I have a letter from Judge Ito requesting tapes for the, the jury. Star Trek, Melrose Place, living single, 60 minutes. What does that say about the jury that said OJ's innocent? That kind of pisses me off a little bit. People take things seriously. They become enmeshed in these characters. Fans love to give me advice because my character oftentimes was a doormat. They love you and they would call you by your character name. People love to come up to me calling me Jane and I had to say, I'm not Jane. I mean, I just started answering to Joe because <laughs> it happened all the time. Joe? Joe. Oh, Joe. I was in a bathroom stall, and this lady was next to me, and all of a sudden she goes, you are nasty, I hate you, you are such a bitch. Oh, by the way, your dress is hideous. I mean, she was so mad. I think she even said, leave Amanda alone. The success of Melrose Place was astounding. It became the must-see TV. It was just something that people caught on to. I think it captured something that we were feeling at the time. Kind of just go, all right, we have an influence here. Melrose Place was making its mark on prime time, but no one was prepared for what was going to happen next. Coming up, porn on parade. The mood when Tracy Lords came on set was electric. He's cute. Ever do him? It's so scandalous. Porn star on Melrose Place. Next, on When Melrose Place Ruled the World. Dans un instant, histoire du phénomène Melrose Place, deuxième partie, dans Story, sur MTV Idol. Tous les mercredis à 21h, Hit List Idol. Retrouvez la playlist d'MTV Idol avec le classement des tubes les plus diffusés de la semaine. Bob Marley, Texas, Marc Lavoine ou encore Nathalie Imbruglia. Voyagez à travers les styles et les années avec le meilleur des années 70 à nos jours. Hit List Idol, tous les mercredis à 21h sur MTV Idol. When Melrose plays Girl the World. By 94, Melrose Place was one of the top-rated primetime shows in the country. It was campy and sexy and over the top. Jake Hansen, you've been a great friend of mine the last couple of years, and I want you to be my best man. 
Go to hell, you son of a bitch. <laughs> the response from the audience was incredible. That's all everybody talked about the next day at work. In the fall of 1994, Fox made a very bold move by moving Melrose from Wednesday night to Monday night. Fox had this brilliant campaign, Mondays are a bitch, with this huge poster of Heather. I'm a bitch, I'm a lover. We went to Monday nights and people went with us. <laughs> Melrose Place was such a phenomenon because it just brought people together. Everyone used to have these Melrose night parties. It just was really great for people to come together in a, you know, lighthearted way. I'd get together with a group of my friends and we'd get popcorn and pizza and junk food. All my girlfriends would come over, sit in front of the television, not say a word to each other until the show was over, and of course talk about it for another hour after the show. I would yell at the screen all the time because the show was so intense. There was yelling at the screen, often followed by shh, because it was Shakespearean dialogue that we didn't want to miss a beat of. I'm going to do you the way you did me. And when I'm done, all you'll be left with is that proverbial wish that you'd never been born. There was the Moro's Place drinking game. Anytime Amanda walks in with a short skirt, have two drinks. Or anytime Joe started complaining. I can't do that, Amanda. Have five drinks. If Kimberly started acting like a psycho. Call me Betsy. Finish your beer. <laughs> you drink when someone gets called a bitch. Crazy bitch. Opportunistic little bitch. There must have been a lot of drunk people <laughs> around if they drank every time we said something like that. Oh my god. Actually, a lot of the crew members and extras who'd work on the show would have Melrose Mondays, and I, I knew who they were because they were throwing up Tuesday morning. Look at every episode of Melrose Place and find something that's a little bit memorable. Good night! A lot of people would come up to me and say, oh, I love that scene when you and Sydney were fighting. Jane and Sydney had this great sibling rivalry. Oh my God. Sydney was supposed to be getting married to Michael um, in the wedding dress that was my grandmother's. Take it off now and then get the hell out of here. Fine, I'm leaving, but the dress goes with me. Sydney, you are out of your mind. Get your hands off of me. That was fun. I remember having to chase after her and grabbing the dress, and the dress would get lifted up a little too far. I finally wound up, you know, duking it out. It was a great cat fight. Swear to God, I will break your arm. I will. Before I break yours. My favorite part of it was when we're in the water and our hair is blowing, you know, floating in the water and we're screaming at each other. And... I hate you! I hate you! Classic Melrose Place. You ruined Grandma's dress! On the contrary, Sid, it's now tailor made for the Bride of Frankenstein. We really thought it was going to be an all-out bitch fest, and then they really touched on some very different things. Allison has these nightmares that start recurring. <laughs> and she begins to realize that she was molested by her father. God, you must... You say anything to anybody, I swear to God, I'll kill you. Once you watch Melrose and you watch those scenes, you just go, God, my day was good. Such a great day. Joe blowing away Reed on the boat was like a little bit more of an action-adventure moment for Melrose Place. Joe gets kidnapped by Reed. You know, I just remember being shoved in this hole in the boat, this, like, you know, storage space. Stupid, Joe. Really stupid. Obviously, I got out because uh, I had to shoot him with the shotgun. I just remember, like, you know, this huge gun that I could barely lift and then, like, you know, aiming and it was like... <laughs> Enjoy going to work and having to do these dramatic things. My name's Ricky. The most memorable part of all of the seasons was really when Tracy Lords came on the show. It's so scandalous. Porn star on Melrose Place. He's cute. Ever do him? No. Why not? He looks ripe for the picking. Great. You know, it works. <laughs> she seemed like 
a fun, provocative person to bring on and out of his place. The mood when Tracy Lords came on set was electric. When you first meet someone that you know has been a porn star, you're obviously intrigued to see what they look like or what they're like as a person. Back off, lady! I made sure that, that Tracy Lords knew that I was Darren Starr's brother. No question. Any cute guys? Tracy Lords was uh, a member of a, of a cult. Not the porno cult, but a different cult. She became her friend initially, and then was trying to lead Sydney into her way of thinking. If you knew that you were going on the most incredible journey, surrounded by people that love you, and that during this journey you'd attain spiritual enlightenment, wouldn't you be happy to wait forever? You can't have Tracy Lords on a show and not give her some type of, like, overtly sexual scene to do. Oh, yeah. The show pushed the envelope in as many ways as possible. But that's beautiful. I mean, who doesn't want controversy? Kimberly always had these really memorable storylines. Kimberly brought an unpredictability to the show. There was always that desperate insanity underneath everything she did. Kimberly was nuts. Certainly one of my favorite plot lines that, that we did on the show was Kimberly kidnapping the baby and making it her own. I uh, came to get my baby like we planned. Kimberly! Kimberly. She steals the baby. Kimberly! Kimberly! I'm screaming and yelling. Oh, no. She's breastfeeding my baby. Mommy's here. I'm here, honey. I'm right here. Yeah, that was weird. That was weird. It was just creepy and, uh, and sadistic. That was so sick. God, she was sick. She was so believable. She could really creep you out because she's just so good. I often see babies now and I look at them lustfully and then I have to turn away just for fear somebody will remember and think I'm about to snatch their little child away. <laughs> One of the most outrageous moments was when Michael and Kimberly had a little too much to drink. He proposed. All right! <laughs> I'll marry you! <laughs> and they promptly crashed. <laughs> I was talking to one of the writers and I said, you know, we just can't, we just can't let her die. Michael, it's Kimberly. She's dead, isn't she? It happened this morning. I remember saying distinctly, you know, if it's a soap opera, nobody's ever dead. And they go, what do you mean? I go, well, they always come back to life. Kimberly came back from the dead. I've come back to claim what's mine, and you're the first thing on my list. So she hooks back up with Michael. I'll be back, okay? Afterwards, she goes into the bathroom with a terrible headache. And we see the biggest reveal in the history of television. The wig scene, I think, is just shocking when she pulls it off and has that giant scar. It just startled you. I still have nightmares of that scar. It was the most frightening thing. You just couldn't speak for like five minutes. Whenever I see Marsha, it's hard not to picture the scar like right there. And sometimes I peek and you just to make sure. I had no idea that was gonna be such a big deal. I'm sure, you know, when I'm 80, they'll be going Meh. There was nothing that Kimberly couldn't be at that point. She was franken bitch. That's the best I've ever seen on television. It really is. You just keep thinking, we can't do any better than this. Once you've reached that peak, it's all downhill. You try to top yourself, and ultimately, in the end, we took ourselves way too far. Coming up... No! An explosive twist. That was taking it pretty far. I mean, where are we going to live now, you know? <laughs> on Melrose Avenue in the gutter. Next, on When Melrose Place Ruled the World. And for everything Melrose Place, go to vh1.com. 
when Melrose plays Girl the World. Sur MTV Idol, MTV Live Unplugged de George Michael. Laissez-vous porter par la voix envoûtante de George Michael lors de ce concert acoustique enregistré en 97. Considéré comme l'une de ses meilleures prestations live par George Michael lui-même, ce concert vous séduira par sa pureté et son ambiance très intimiste. Demain à 21h, MTV Live Unplugged de George Michael sur MTV Idol. Un simple regard sur votre voiture vous fait déprimer. Vous sentez bien qu'on se moque d'elle dans votre dos. Malgré tous vos efforts, vous préférez encore prendre le bus. MTV transforme votre épave en voiture de star. Inscrivez-vous vite sur PipMyRideIn.com et participez à l'édition européenne de Pip My Ride. Tous les soirs, à 21h, sur MTV Idol, retrouvez les plus belles sessions live. Les making-of exclusifs des tournages des plus gros clips. Le hit-list des plus grands tubes depuis les années 70. Des reportages rares, des docu d'exception, des images d'archives, mais aussi des moments cultes avec Celebrity Deathmatch et Bibi and Butthead. Hello Tous les soirs, à 21h, retrouvez le must des années 70 à nos jours, sur MTV Idol. And Melrose Place Girl of the World. The past three years had been a whirlwind for the cast of Melrose. Everyone falls in love with this building and these characters. The show was the hugest hit. Our show was about people being in really crazy situations. Come on and kill me if you can! Michael, please! <laughs> You kill me or love me. If you make up your damn mind. You still have an audience that is rooting for you. Fans love the outrageous plots, and the writers were not about to let them down. The blessing and the curse of Melrose Place is that we always have to kind of top ourselves. We got Zanier, and I think it was a case of we've got to outdo what we did last year. This season ender has to be better. They decided the third season was going to end with the destruction of the Melrose Place complex. Let me go. I'm gonna call the cops. What? Can you tell them I'm making a bomb? I don't think so. Blowing up the building was just the natural evolution of where Kimberly was going and this kind of like, you know, ultimate crazy act. Is that what it looks like? Kimberly. Kimberly. It's worse. No! They could not air that episode because of the Oklahoma City bombing. I think they did the right thing by holding off on it. It's just really bad timing. Basically, we decided to delay it until the, the next season. No! And it was just like this crazy scene. What are the chances of that happening? That was 
taken it pretty far. I mean, where are we going to live now, you know? <laughs> on Melrose Avenue, in the gutter. I don't know if anything happened aside from a few scrapes and things like that. I mean, what do you do after that? After you blow up the building, how do you top that? When Kimberly blew up Melrose Place, that's when the show took a whole different turn. It reached a whole different level. I seem to remember feeling like we've jumped the shark, we're in trouble. It was after that, that storyline just became a little more unbelievable. You're so unbelievable. Don't know something stinks until you smell it. And then behind the scenes, there were a lot of changes happening. Darren Starr left the show. It was a good point for me to make a transition and, and start looking at, at, at other things. Darren went on to do Central Park West. I remember finding out that Darren was leaving and I was really surprised and I was really upset and I kind of felt like you brought me into this thing, where are you going? Darren Starr leaving the show also marked a very different creative time. When Darren left, we went bigger and bigger and bigger. No, no more games. Bastard. Bastard! Melrose Place, there were some over-the-top storylines. I remember there was one storyline when we had Patrick Muldoon on the show. He had tried to rape me, and so we were going to kill him. Jane and Sydney tried to bury Richard. He's not buried deep enough. Jane, I don't know about you, but I am done for the night. I remember us being out in the cold in the desert and shoveling the dirt up. And then the last scene of that, his hand came popping up out of the dirt. I mean, those were moments that you kind of said, oh my god, is this even Melrose Place? Melrose became more and more campy or had more and more black comedy to it. It's burned in my memory forever when we had Jack Wagner in an operating room. Yeah, I guess I was going to give him a lobotomy. Now, as you know, Mr. Peters, we'll be doing a temporal lobotomy. The anesthesia we've given you will allow you to remain awake. You won't feel any pain, but I will get the distinct pleasure of seeing that manipulative little light in your eyes as it goes out for the very last time. It was both absurd and over the top. <laughs> It was just an image where I went, what have we done? They wanted craziness, they wanted sex, they wanted insane asylums. Because that's ultimately where we all belong anyway. The most memorable scene was when Taylor drugged Peter and needed to make it look like Peter Burns beat her up. Uh, You're gonna have to hit me. Oh, no, no, I never hit a woman in my life. Well, do you want to keep your record or do you want to be chief of staff? Um, look, I'm not gonna hit you, and that's fine. Michael, you cannot wimp out on me now. This is too important to both of us. Now take your best shot. Michael, hit me! Michael, I hit can't. me! I can't! I'm sorry. Ow! Ow, oh, what did you do that for? Come on! If I can hit you, you can hit me! So I take the door, and I slam it against my head, you know, five times. What are you doing? But you couldn't. Huh? This huge bruise all over my face, this big black eye. I had to do it. Because I love you that much, Peter. It's the funniest thing to this day that I've ever done. By season five, a lot of the cast members were starting to get itchy to move on to other things. The mood on the set when the main characters were leaving, people were sad. They'd been together for five years. I felt like that I'd done everything, explored every facet of this woman beyond even credibility. So, I mean, it was time for me to move on. Laura, like, you know, left eventually. I think Courtney had other plans. Of course, when I left, it all went to pieces, but we won't talk about that. I 
hate when original cast members leave shows. It's the worst thing to do to the fans. The minute the, the core characters started wandering off, so did our interest, because these were the characters that we came to know and love. It made you nervous, like it's the end. So we kind of knew, you know, the, the light was dimming at the end of our tunnel. Coming up, Melrose Place loses its lease. I have to say I was shocked. Like, what? Really? It's really going to happen? Everyone had slept with each other, I guess. There was no one left to Next, on When Melrose Place Ruled the World. Dans un instant, histoire du phénomène Melrose Place, deuxième partie, dans Story, sur MTV Idol. Tous les week-ends à 13h30 et 19h sur MTV Idol, retrouvez le meilleur des années 70 à nos jours. Les plus belles sessions live, les making-of exclusifs des tournages des plus gros clips, des reportages rares, des docus d'exception et des images d'archives. Tous les week-ends à 13h30 et 19h, vous avez rendez-vous avec le must des années 70 à nos jours sur MTV Idol. When Melrose Place Girl the World. By 97, the show's success was waning. It became a different Melrose Place. There was a conceit that we can plug anybody into this building. The building is the star of the show. When we lost a lot of the core actors, you know, you lost a bit of the audience. People are like, it's not the same old show I used to watch. The show brought on a lot of new faces. You had Kelly Rutherford as Megan. Rob Estes as Kyle. Jamie Lerner as Lexi. David Charvet from Baywatch. I think our mistake was we brought in too many. Every time you turned around, that apartment was changing owners, changing tenants. I think that did confuse people. It just started to get a little stale. I want to share everything with you. I do. I love you. Michael, those are just words. Oh. I need more than that. I, I need actions. The ratings started going down. It was tough. We could start to see the writing on the wall. Everyone had slept with each other, I guess. There was no one left to f We received a letter from Aaron saying that, you know, thank you so much for these great years, but the show is going to be canceled. Everybody was profoundly sad. I have to say I was shocked. Like, what? Really? It's really going to happen? I'll never forget shooting the last episode. Keep talking. I like this. Taking a big chunk of my cash, we get out of the country before anybody misses us. I think there were two endings written, so no one really knew what was going to happen. You saw Amanda and Peter fake their deaths. Amanda and Peter? Good day but then they turned out to be happy and alive. A man and I, you know, land on this island together. You see them on the beach getting married. You make us feel bright. I felt so honored to be in the last scene of the show. A family? Oh, I hadn't thought that far ahead. Oh yeah, I already got the names picked out. We got a Billy and an Allison. We got a Matt, Jake, <laughs> a Jane, and a Kyle. Maybe a Mike. Just no Kimberly, though. Promise? I promise. I remember every moment of it. I was directing and had written the final episode. And then I arranged the last shot. And we walked off on the beach. It was very touching. For the last day, you know, it's bittersweet, saying goodbye to everybody. There were a lot of tears, a lot of hugs. It was sad. It was really sad. It was like, huh, gosh, we can't live together in the dorm anymore. Any great thing has to come to its end. Melrose officially went off the air in 99. Seven years is a very good run. The show meant something to a lot of people. I had a lot of time to practice my craft. I got to work hard and explore and play. That's a great gift. It set up a, a great future for me, and I'm grateful for that. 
I had a lot of fun doing it and seeing how the audience was enjoying the show because I think that really inspired all of us. To this day, people come up and say, you know, God, we miss Melrose. The Melrose Place always left you with this feeling that maybe you weren't so crazy. Melrose was one of a kind. <laughs> there hasn't been a show like that ever since.